<laughs> so if you guys have any questions about anything, it, it could be basic questions about theology, it could be basic questions about the philosophy of the church, it could be a basic question about our facilities and what's going on in our church. I mean, you might have a basic question on how in the world do we get in and out of our parking lot now that they're done with the street in the front? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one, right? Where's LJ? He had a part to do with that, you know. <laughs> all right, David, yeah, you had a question. Uh, so with all that's happening with uh, Hamas and Israel right now, and a lot of speculation that uh, the Jews could be taking on into not really America, but uh, Israel going into a war that could lead into a Middle East situation. Yeah, my, my personal opinion is it's, it's always a sign of the end time whenever it involves Israel, you know. Um, but, the, but the thing is, there, there have been many, many of these uh, skirmishes over the years. Um, I've been, so I was actually scheduled with my daughter uh, in, in a week and a half to head to, to Israel. <laughs> Lo and behold, they're having this weird thing and we're not going. Uh, it's pushed back to the fall. Right, so uh, I was going to make this trip, but I've been there during other tr other fights like this. You know, they had their skirmishes with Lebanon and uh, multiple times now, um, and it's well in hand. Uh, I I'm not overly worried about it, uh, in in the sense that right now Israel has pretty darn good standing with many in the Middle East, like many people behind the scenes, many Muslim countries have been making deals with Israel, trade deals and all kinds of things, and making peace with Israel, including Saudi Arabia, right, and uh, Dubai and Morocco, notably, and uh, these places. And so this particular one isn't perking my interest as much just because of the, the environment of just coming off of Trump and we're, I think we're still living in Trump's positive um, uh, health or help for Israel. That's just my personal opinion and personal feeling. Uh, so personally right now, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. Um, Chuck Smith always believed that, um, that, that, that once the ball really gets rolling with all the main players and they're all attacking, and it's looked like that for, in the past more so than it does right at this moment because it doesn't seem like places like Turkey are too interested right now. And, and, so, uh, and, and it doesn't seem like Russia's too interested in it right now. It just seems like a Palestinian you know, uh, lurch as it were, you know. So that's what it seems like. So it's bad because the missiles are always getting better. Every, every year that they start shooting missiles into Israel, they get better and better and better. So it was, they could barely get over their own fence, you know, and then they would get to Ashdod and various places down on the, on the coastal plains and to the outskirts in the southern end of Tel Aviv. But now they're able to shoot into Tel Aviv and, and randomly shoot kind of in the, in the general direction of Jerusalem. And it's becoming more and more of a problem. So in that sense, it could escalate quickly. But Israel's pretty incredible, you know, and they're really hush-hush on everything that they have. But my, my guess is Israel's military is more advanced than ours because they're surrounded by a billion people that hate their guts, you know, and uh, their survival depends upon that, but they just keep their mouth shut on what they really have. So I, it could, but it doesn't seem like everybody's drawn in at the moment. That's, that's my particular view. I could be wrong, but again, that's just my opinion. It is interesting, though. Every time, Israel, every time that starts popping up, it's like, mm. <laughs> if it goes bad, it could go bad quickly. So, anything else? No, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay. Vanna White was up here with her sign. <laughs> Jacob White. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes. When's the coffee shop scheduled for? Uh, <laughs> put Bob on the spot. No, actually, a lot of work has been done. You know, if you ever come by and Bob's working and he's in there, you can take a look at it. It's uh, we got the counters up and going, and we're working on the electrical and the lights. And the kids did come in and help with that quite a bit. Part of the floors in, um, but yeah, it's looking good. So I don't think it's too far away. Within a couple of months is is my guess. Enough space, Bob.
Yeah, so that was about the coffee shop. When's it going to be done? <laughs> so, yes, Glenn. I think the question should be, uh, if I have some time to volunteer, when can I come help get the coffee shop done? So Bob just rephrased your question, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> How can I help get the coffee shop done is the question that he rephrased your question to be. <laughs> so, yeah. Any, anybody else? I'm excited about the coffee shop because the purpose of the coffee shop is fellowship and discipleship, you know, and, and really it's, it's not like coffee shops are cool, but we're not doing it to be cool. We're doing it to be effective, you know, so we want to make it cool for sure, but we want to make it effective. We want us to, to be able to be more family. So my, my good f friend David has a coffee shop, and I just see so many people hanging out there and fellowshipping there all the time. So I love it. Yes, sir, Alan. When will we do another pastor's book club? Pastor's book club. Okay, interesting. <laughs> what I'm working on this summer is I'm actually working on um, curriculum. to. So the book club was kind of, you know, is there interest in moving forward into doing more Bible classes? And so we're moving again towards a school of ministry, but what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do it very user-friendly. And uh, so in the past when we've done schools of ministry, we've either gone way too far where we've had classes that were way too heavy in Greek and Hebrew, homiletics, hermeneutics, all this stuff, and we're, we're getting way too heady, heady. And then other times we borrowed someone else's curriculum because we didn't want to re rewrite the will. But what we're going to do is we're going to do ministry like four or five different sections and they're going to do with ministry here at the church, which will also bleed over if the Lord sends people other places. But we're going to have basic things like counseling, you know, um, uh, basic evangelism and church ministries, uh, basic theology, basic apologetics, uh, witnessing, you know, these various different uh, things, uh, topics. And, and we'll do them on Saturday mornings and we'll do them in chunks of three to five weeks. Uh, so it doesn't take too much time away from family, right? So, and I'll be teaching most of those sections. I really want my elders to, to jump in also and uh, grab some of those sections that they enjoy. But uh, so we're, we're going to make it very user-friendly, but very specific to our church, and it will carry over to other churches, and, and we're going to write the whole curriculum ourselves. So that's where that is leading. Within that, there'll be books to read, right, and, and, and all. So... Um, and if it ends up being delayed, we'll do another book club. But yeah, those, are, those book clubs are fun. So, all right. Any other, uh, did someone else have a question? All right, well, Shule asked me a question. She said, uh, and I'll answer this for her, but for you guys to hear. She said, oh, I was reading some of the creeds of old, and she goes, I really agree with them, but where's the rapture in the old creeds? They never talk about it. My answer is this. Rapture is a secondary uh, doctrine. It's, it's not a primary doctrine. Uh, what do I mean? Well, it's not a doctrine of salvation. It might affect the way you live, but it's not, it's not a basic or a primary um, uh, um, a doctrine that every everybody that's a believer believes the same on these issues, right? And it's secondary in this sense that you can win the argument but still be wrong, <laughs> right? So, so it's not something that we, we necessarily argue over. Um, and so she had asked that question. And that's why you find the creeds are gen very general because they're, they're making a statement that the whole church can buy in on, right? So these ancient creeds are... You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, salvation by faith alone, um, their salvation through faith by grace alone. You know, the Lord is coming back, heaven is real. Uh, you know, these, these different doctrines that every believer believes in. You know, these are the things that the creeds normally cover. All right. We good? Yeah, I mean, so, so if you are a pre-rapture or if you are a pre-trib rapture person, meaning uh, that uh, Enoch being, the question is, is Enoch uh, an example of the rapture? He can be. Uh, what we do is if we believe in a certain way, we're going to go find examples that support our beliefs, 
right? And so there's not a rapture chapter in the Bible, right? There's a few verses that are pretty clear in my mind, but again, it's a culmination of a bunch of different verses. And so uh, Enoch uh, being a picture of the rapture, why? Well, Enoch um, was taken. He never died, right? Enoch is a predecessor, Noah's grandfather, and he never died, but he went away before the, before the wrath of God was poured out on the earth through the flood, right? So uh, some people would, we would, if you're a preacher or a rapture person like myself, you would see that as an example, but it isn't, it isn't definitive proof. And so this is what we always do. If the Bible agrees with us, we grab it. If it doesn't, <laughs> we kind of ignore it. <laughs> you know? So that's where these doctrines end up. But yeah, so Enoch would be what is called a type or an Old Testament illustration of the rapture, supporting the rapture, but not necessarily definitive. So it's just one of those things we would look at as a possibility. So, all right. Well, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get into uh, Job chapter 30. Dear God, we thank you uh, for these last few weeks. have been busy, crazy, fun, also tiring, Lord, National Day of Prayer was an incredible uh, day, Lord, for, for many of us, and we thank you for it, Lord, and we thank you for Corpus Christi and what you've been doing here in the Coastal Bend, Lord, amongst the pastors and the churches, Lord, and, and I really think you've helped us as pastors fall more in love with you and get our eyes in the right place, Lord, and we just pray, pray that for the rest of the country, Lord. We thank you that, uh, we thank you for Corpus Christi, Lord, that has done well, Lord, through COVID. Lord, we, th we thank you that, that uh, it hasn't been crazy like we've heard in other places. Lord, we thank you that through this racial unrest, Lord, there's been so little here. Um, what a blessing. And we've heard about it all over the country, Lord, even in Austin as well, Lord, locally in, in uh, Dallas and Houston, Lord. And so we are thankful. Lord, we are, we are thankful for the lives that you have given us to this point, Lord. And may it be that more and more in this room, in this church, in this body, that we experience just the surrender to and the joy of living a simple, quiet, unnoticed life, as it were, to the world perhaps. But Lord, making waves in heaven through obedience, through love, through caring, through our prayers, Lord. Sounding alarms, sounding the gong, as it were, <laughs> through our prayers and being willing to be obedient to the call in the simplest way to people that the world may just look over. Lord, may it be that, that our integrity is something before you that... that we can, as Job, just know, yeah, we're still sinners, but man, Lord, you know our heart. May we be able to plead that with you, God. So purify our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So Job, the way Job was set up, so we know in the beginning God sets up this deal, not this deal, but this kind of, well, let's frame it this way. It kind of sets up a bet with Satan. <laughs> you can't get Job to curse me. You can't kill him. And uh, first time, Job loses everything. Job still has his health. Second time Satan comes, God allows him to touch his health. And so here's Job, man. He's sitting, and his friends show up, and he's covered in scabs, and there's maggots living within his scabs, and he's taking rocks, and he's just trying to break the scabs off of his body. And, and his friends come, and they sit with him quietly for seven days. The best ministry they had to him were those seven days, because as soon as they opened their mouth, it was over. And they had a very simplistic philosophy, which in some ways is right, in some ways very wrong, and they were mixing up their philosophy. Their philosophy was karma. What comes around goes around, which sometimes happens, but it doesn't always happen, and praise God. Because if we all got exactly what we deserved, we'd all be in trouble, right? But there is the grace and there is the mercy and there is the love of God reaching out. And Job knew this. And Job also knew his own heart and he knew his integrity was above the integrity of men around him. But he was also a servant and he was a source of wisdom for all. 
And then all of a sudden he's suffering greatly. And it's almost like these guys were jealous of Job before his trials. And they're coming at him, these three friends. And, and, and they come at him and they just start digging and digging. And you know, they took three rounds of digs at, at Job and Job would respond every time. They're done taking their digs at Job, and Job is responding for the final time. Now, last week, I was in bed with the chills and chattering my teeth. <laughs> I was not feeling well. So we, we weren't here last week. We had a time of prayer before the National Day of Prayer. And, uh, but the week before that, we'd looked at the fact that Job was responding. He was responding to that final attack. And so we're going to look at more of his response here. So we understood that he talked about defend, uh, that he was a blessing to those that were in need. We're going to hear more of that a little bit later. He gave wisdom to those who sought it. He was fair in business and generous towards those in need. But he was still suffering. And he points this out in chapter 30. He, he says, this is how bad it's gotten. Chapter 30, verse 1, he says, But now they mock at me, men younger than I, Again, you're supposed to respect your elders. Whose fathers I disdain to put with the dogs of my flock. So the children of men who weren't good enough to hang out with my sheep dogs. Like I'd be telling my dogs, watch out for that one. <laughs> you know, the children of these men, they are now mocking me from, from a man that was sought out by many for wisdom, by the wise for wisdom. The wisest of the wise would come to Job for wisdom, and now the lowest of the low are mocking Job. Verse 2, Indeed, what profit is the strength of their hands to me? Their vigor has perished. They are gaunt from want and famine, fleeing late into the wilderness, desolate and waste, who pluck the mallow by the bushes and the broom tree roots for their food. And so these men that, are be, that were raised by corrupted men are corrupt themselves, and they're wandering out, and they are outcasts, and they, they eat roots for their meals. They eat mallow, which isn't very good. It's a, it's a salt marsh uh, plant. And they would eat these horrible foods. These guys are mocking me. Verse 5, they were driven out from among men. They shouted at them as a thief. They had to live in the clefts of the valleys, in the caves of the earth and the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed. Under the nestles they, uh, the nettles they nestled. They were sons of fools. Yes, sons of vile men. They were scourged from the land. And now I am their taunting song. I am their byword. They're calling you uh, Job. They're calling each other Job. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're not, they're, 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 they're the men that are in trouble, the riffraff, as it were. He goes on to say, in verse 10, they abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face because he has loosed my bowstring and afflicted me. They have cast off restraint before me. And he's saying, God has cut my bowstring. He's taken my vigor. He's taken my strength. He's taken my worth. What, what is a, a, a bow if the string is not strong? It has nothing, right? It, it has nothing to offer. And everything's been taken from Job. And these men are coming at him, and they don't have any hesitation to attack him because they just feel like he deserves it because he feels like God is punishing him. Verse 12, at my right hand, the rabble arises. They push away my feet and they raise against me their ways of destruction. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. They have no helper. They come as broad breakers. Under the ruinous storm, they roll along. I'm in their way and they just kick me over. They kick me out of the way. And, uh, and you know, they're just, they're just making fun of me. And Job is like all of us, right? We enjoy it when someone famous or intelligent knows our name. You know, someone recognizes you in a crowd and you're like, Job understands what that feels like. But how is it when someone that you don't respect gets on your case and says something about you. This happens more and more, doesn't it? 
I look at the TV and people say things and I go, what do you know? You know, they, they say stuff about Christian, you know, like, these people are disregarding God, you know, and you're like, who are you? You know, and, and you can get so upset, right, at these fools. But it's, re it's very real for us when people don't respect us or people say stuff foolishly about us. But understand, there's something very important, and I've been, you know, learning this more and more over my lifetime, is God's desire for us is that we become more concerned about what he thinks of us than what people do or what people think of us. And guys, it is so important. We get so hurt and we get so mad at people's opinion of us. But, you know, none of that has to affect us if we have integrity before God. You guys realize that, right? I have people that attack me, and I don't know what's going on in their life, right? And so, you know, the church is a hospital for the hurting. It's also a gym for the healthy, right? We want to get fit. It's, it's, a, it's boot camp to send you out. But it's really a place also where we need to be able to come in and become healthy. And so... What I had to realize over the years is sometimes God brings people in and he wants me and the leadership and those that are more mature to minister into their life and help them. But it's very, it's, it's very interesting, especially in, in this broken world where, where men have been abused and broken and haven't had fathers or good fathers at least, you know, and, and, and they show up in church and all of a sudden I'm an authority figure. The elders are authority figures, you know, and they don't know how to handle authority at all. And if you're a, a boss at a business, you've had young men, and they seem like they have the intelligence and they have the, the strength and the dexterity to do the job you're asking them to do, but some, they just blow up. Like, they, what happened? And what happens is they're, they're broken inside, and you can't see that wound, and you can't see the, the ugliness of what has taken place in their life, and you, you, you can't look back in the history scope of their, 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 the reels of their memory and how they've been abused by authority in the past or probably just very absent from a relationship with the Father. And God has brought them here, and he doesn't give you that reel. He doesn't give you that information about them, and all of a sudden you're shocked and surprised. And you know what? first view or, or, or first attack that I get towards me as an authority figure, I'm always offended. But what does the Lord tell me? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Catch yourself before you wreck yourself. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Figure it out, Rod. This person's broken. I brought them to you for you to heal. If you remain angry at them, you can't heal them. And so I'm in a much better place when I've learned this lesson that my worth, that my value comes from the Lord. And even if you're attacking me, I don't have to respond in like fashion. So then the Bible says things like this for those that are able. Listen, love those that despitefully use you. Love your enemy. They're broken, they're messed up. And I love you more than they hate you. That's what I've come to have to understand. God loves me more than anybody, any of you could hate me, right? I just got people around town sometimes, ah! you know, and I'm like, I don't even know why. I just know they're broken, you know, so I just smile, praise God, you know, like. But at first, man, it really hurts, it really hurts, and I've got to catch myself and remember that my identity is wrapped up in God. So then I'm able to hurt those that aren't loving me. And what did Christ do? Even while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He showed us that example of what it means to love those that, in a sense, at the moment hate you, right? And I'm telling you guys as men, if you're married, man, this is a key to learn. You know who your strength is, men? The Lord. Your wife has you as a covering and the Lord as a covering, but your covering is the Lord, not your wife. So when your wife's had a hard day, she might take it out on you because you're the easiest target and you're this tough big man and strong and everything else. You don't take it back out on her. Mm -mm. Because your strength is in the Lord. You know what? When you see it that way, you get to be a hero. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, right? 
And God set us up as men to be real men this way, like Jesus loved the church, right? If I have a bad day, Jesus still loves me just the same. So this identity issue is so important to understand that even if the world's against you, God loves you. And, and that you are really strong, not just having a stiff upper lip like the English, right? Not just a philosophy, but really knowing the Lord and knowing that the Lord loves you so much and that your identity is wrapped up in him and his opinion matters way more than anybody else's in your life. And so this is so important. It says in John 12, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. What was their problem? They were too worried about what other people thought of them to confess the Lord. At least they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. The cool thing is God is patient with us, right? Because if you read about Nicodemus in John chapter 3, it's like, he kind of failed the test, right? You don't really hear too much. And he starts to defend Jesus a little bit. But by the end, he's willing to be unclean during the Passover ceremony services and pull Jesus' bloody and unclean body off of the cross and wrap it up and put it in a grave. See that process? Like, oh. And then he comes to the point where I'm fully identified with Jesus. This is why baptism was so much more impactful back then, and it needed to be public, right? Because Christianity wasn't popular or accepted. And you fully identified, and you're saying, I care more about your opinion of me, Lord, than I care about others' opinion of, of me. When we love others more than God, we try to please others first, and we're going to be pulled away from the truth. When we love God more than others, we will be the one... or. Uh, when we love God more than others, he will be the one that we aim to please. You know, and, and being up with, with Hannah, you know, when she was falsely accused, you know, there were, there were probably five very notable pastors in town that just, they dove all in. One of those pastors of the largest, probably richest, most powerful, politically influential churches in town lost his job because of Hannah. And he's like, I don't care. I'm, I'm aiming to please God. And a lot of people thought he was dumb and people that were kind of on the outskirts of Christianity or whatever. But this guy is still a legend to us pastors in town and we love this guy. Every so often I'll give him a call just to see how he's doing. You know, he went from a church of probably 2,000 people to a church of about 400 and he goes, Rod, I visited or I started pastoring this church and I promptly grew it from 400 to 200. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, praise God. He, did, he, he grew it from 400 to 200 with integrity and he's exactly what that church needed. A pastor that really loved God more than the fame, right? More than the compromise. So it's just very important. So he recognized, we can recognize this in him. He goes on in verse 15, and he says, Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my honor as the wind, and my prosperity has passed like a cloud. And now my soul is poured out because of my plight. The days of affliction take hold of me. My bones are, my bones are pierced in me at night, and my gnawing pains take no rest. Now, it's interesting when he says my bones are, uh, are pierced in me at night and some you know talk about his diseases but it also reminds me of david because he's hurting physically but he's also hurting emotionally and uh i've felt low level depression but i've never been given to actual chemical depression or, or long-term depression but people very close to me have and i've had to deal with it over the years but David describes it this way. He says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes waste away with grief, my soul and my body, for my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. And when people 
who, who struggle with depression or have more chemical imbalance induced depression, they, they read this and they go, yep, good description, <laughs> you know? So God knows. God's dealt with this, and God doesn't reject you. He still loves you. In, in David's case, it was caused from sin, but that's not always um, the case, right? But um, so I think Job is depressed emotionally, physically, and spir spiritually confused for sure, right? But emotionally broken and physically broken. It's, it's like the trifecta. Here he is, right? He says in verse 18, my great, the, by great force, my garment is disfigured. It binds me about as the collar of my coat. And what he's describing there is he feels like he's a puppet and God's just going like this with him. One interpretation says, with a strong hand, God grabs my shirt. He grips me by the collar of my coat, <laughs> you know? And you could imagine that's a, probably a pretty good description. He cast me into the mire, and I've become like dust and ashes. And so he's saying this to the, to the other people. This is what it's like. This is what's happening in my life, you guys, that are just casting fuel on the fire of my pain. Thank you so much. What a blessing you guys have been. And now he cries out directly to the Lord for a little bit. He says in verse 20, I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up, and you... And you regard me, but you have become cruel to me with the strength of your hand. You oppose me. You lift me up to the wind and cause me to ride on it. You spoil my success, for I, for I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. Surely he would not stretch out his hand against a heap of ruins if they cry out when he destroys it. And so he still holding on to what he knows about the character of God. When I die, you're still going to be there. And he's hanging on. Have I not wept for him who was in trouble? Verse 25. Has not my soul grieved for the poor? But when I looked for good, evil came to me. And when I waited for the light, then came darkness. So he does, he does have an expectation. You live good, then it's all blessings. Right? And is that expectation always right? No. It isn't always right. So sometimes our expectations and presumptions are wrong about walking with Jesus. So we have some wonderful promises as God's children. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I have for you, thoughts... Uh, it says the Lord, Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Right? But again, that specific promise is from Jeremiah to the Jews who are in exile. So for the nation, you know, it doesn't mean that individual Jews can't go through trial and suffering or get run over by an ox and die. Right? But it's, a, it's as a nation. And sometimes we go, but God, you, and we point to certain verses and we're not necessarily rightfully applying them. But here's the thing. In general, the principle behind that verse is good. One of the early fights I got in with my wife, I think it was before we were married, she goes, my life verse is this verse. Now, she is quarter Jewish, and so she would have been killed during the Holocaust. So it kind of applies to her as a Jewish person. But <laughs> I told her, I go, that was to the Jews you know, going into exile under Jeremiah. And she's like, why do you always steal all my wonderful blessings? You know, I, mean, was like, I was hit by all this emotion and interpretation for, rip, you know, again, because I'm an intellectual nerd, right? So, so I got caught up in that, and she's like trying to say, no, but God spoke to me through this verse. And for sure, God did. And I understand all the principles behind it, but I had to throw in my little nerdy thing in there and kind of blow up her joy. You know, it's like, huh. So I, I have to be careful about that. <laughs> and she has to be aware. She married a nerd. That's her problem. <laughs> it should have been in our, our, our vows, you know, <laughs> through nerdy times and not. <laughs> even when he's unsensitive, you know, like, even when he's sensitive like a rock lord, I will still be committed to him. <laughs> But there are promises like this in Romans chapter 8. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered us up for him all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Now, in the proper context, that's one of those things we can pick apart and just go, oh, God, thank you. Because he's talking before that, you know, Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for the good, right? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, what? To be conformed into the image of Christ. So everything that we go through can be for the ultimate good of conforming us into the image of Christ for how long? Eternity, right? I mean, it's, it's valuable beyond anything this world can give us, you know? So you can, there, there are good promises, but we just need to be careful how we treat the promises of God and manipulate them at times, right? He is good, but sometimes his time frame of doing the work is longer than our patience, or it's longer than our expectation or our particular personal interpretation. Sometimes it's just true, and so sometimes... You know, like my dad was famous for always saying that, that quote that just says, I don't know what God's doing, but he's doing something. Again, since we're on the topic of Hannah and Larry, you guys, we fought for seven and a half years to get Hannah out of prison. And every time, like about every six months, we were hoping on this major court filing or judges find, finding or something from the Supreme Court. or so, We're always waiting on something. And, and for... Seven of those seven and a half years, it was no. And I'd look at Larry, and Larry would always say, I guess God has something else to do. Right? I, I guess God still has something else to do. Oh, so hard. Right? But even knowing that God always has a plan, and it isn't always our plan, but it's good for eternity and beyond our understanding many times. Just the way it is. And uh, how, how do you deal with that? Well, you get to know God better and how huge he is and how much he does love us and what he's already done for us and the promises that he actually has for us. Not heaven, this side of heaven. This isn't heaven. This, this isn't, this is the, the, the earth, the waiting place where good and evil are mixed in together, where people are making choices that matter for all of eternity. He hasn't separated it all out yet. He hasn't redeemed it all back to himself, but he will, and those are the promises. People always ask, you know, if God is good, how come there's evil in the world? You say, let me rephrase that for you in, in the way that I see it. God is good. And he still, uh, still allows for evil because he's patient for evil to come for cleansing. But eventually, evil will be absolutely separated out for, for, from good. You just need to make sure that you make provision to be good. Because eventually, there will be a separation. Don't overestimate your own goodness. Right? I mean, it's, it's coming. I mean, that was the question you had, right, David? Like, <laughs> it looks like it's right there, you know. It's... The time, the time piece is Israel. Tick, tick, tick. When, is, when does it start ticking again? You know, it's right there. So watch out. And so Paul indicates another promise there in Romans 8, right? It's so full of great promises. Neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities. But here's another one. What does he say? Romans 8, 36. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Boy, that one you should find in your bathroom promise box. <laughs> no, that's not one I hold on to. Like, oh, Lord, I, let's just pray this over my daughter's life. You know, or something like that. I don't do that, right? But what does he say in verse 37? Get in all these things, we are more than conquerors. And so kind of what this says to me is, this side of heaven, we're going to go through crazy stuff. But no matter how crazy it gets, you guys know the term ragdolled? And, and I guess you might use it in wrestling, right? Surfers use it. When, when a big wave pounds you, you're a ragdoll. You know, you're like one of those blow-up things in front of the tire stores or whatever. I mean, you're just like, whoa! Your, your body goes in places it just shouldn't go. And you're getting ragdolled. But it, sometimes it feels like this world is doing that, right? Like, like Job described, my clothes are all out of place. You're grabbing the back of my shirt and you're just ripping me up. But the thing is, God's promises are no matter how ragdolled you are, 
no matter how crazy this world gets, what does Paul say? We are more than conquerors. That is a promise that I hold on to. Right? I, I could have never imagined the degradation of our nation so quickly. It was all happening under the surface, but now it's exposed, isn't it? Their absolute rabid hatred for anything moral that is of God. And as Isaiah said, you know, good has become evil. You know, woe to those who put light for darkness and darkness for light, good for evil and evil for good. You know, and whoa, and we're there. Good things are now bad. You know, we, we, we had a, uh, a birthing person's celebration on Sunday. Because we can't say mother because it's offensive. Are you kidding me? You know, and, and pretty soon, I think in May or June, I think maybe it's early June, you know, we have, we have lawn mowing person's day. I guess. I don't know. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. You know, it's just, just weird. Like, evil. Having parents are evil. And so, can I be ragdolled in this world, this side? I can be. But you know what? You know who's got me? The Lord. As bad as he can get. I'm still more than a conqueror. God is for us, but it doesn't mean that life will always be evil. We always got to remember we live in a fallen world, and sometimes we may be touched by great evil. Verse 27, my heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. The old King James reads, my, my bowels boiled and rested not. <laughs> so it was affecting his physical, physical comfort. Verse 28, I go about mourning, but not in the sun. I Stand up in the assembly and cry out for help. I'm a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. My skin grows black and falls from me. My bones burn with fever. My harp is turned to mourning and my flute to the voice of those who weep. But now we come to chapter 31 where he again pleads his innocence. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? So what is he, what is he saying? He's just saying, I did good. I took care of the poor and everything. I, I, I shared my wisdom with people. And then this happens. I, this is how I feel. But these are other good things that I did. I made a covenant with my eyes. And what does he say? Well, I've, clo I've, I've closed my gate to lust. So males and even Job were created with visual attraction to the female form. This is a reality of life, right? Is that a bad thing? No, God created it. It is a wonderful thing when it's used in God's parameters. You don't think is that my wife, you know, loves it that I think she's gorgeous? My wife absolutely loves it, and I love it that I think she's gorgeous. I can't lust after my wife. You guys realize I cannot lust for my wife. Because lust is a desire for that which is forbidden, and my wife is not forbidden. This is God's design. This is good, right? Sometimes when I'm, 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 I'm counseling, premarital counseling, you know, kids that have been raised in the Christian church, and I get to, you know, that, that part of the premarital counseling, they're looking at me like, oh, you're kidding me? You're telling me this is good? I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, because your parents have been telling you no, no, no forever, and I'm saying yes, 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 you know, so it's like, it's always a freak out time. I did my own daughter's uh, premarital counseling. She's looking at me like, Dad. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's awesome when used properly, and it's abused and destructive when left unchecked and out of God's will. Isn't it? This is one of the drives that just destroys the world and makes things yucky and leads to rape and molestation and pornography and all kinds of bizarre things that this world has. And it is destructive to others and destructive to one's health, but very healthy, this desire, within a marriage relationship, within God's parameters. And so many things are like that. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, and when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. What a blessing. 
But then he goes on to say, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it, it brings forth death. You know, and so you raise kids and they have these natural things in them. A woman has natural things in her and a, a young man has natural things in him. But what, is, what, are, what are the Christian parents supposed to do? Not supposed to cut away those things, but to guide them in the proper direction. You know, and, and, and a woman that's been raised properly, is she's going to be beautiful unto the Lord. And, and she is... I mean, women are incredible creatures from a man's perspective, you know, uh, just amazing the, the different drives that women have to get things done and make things beautiful and aesthetic and to take care of things. And, you know, and, and you think about so many different things than we do. We're like, eh, and you're like, oh, no, I'm passionate about this, you know, and what do we try to do, crush it? No, we're supposed to let it go and encourage it in the right direction. And it's a beautiful thing. I was talking to these young people and, uh, you know, sometimes when you read the scriptures, it's like you misinterpret what a church is supposed to be. Yes, men are supposed to be in leadership in order not to abuse the marriage relationship where uh, the, the men are supposed to be in leadership. But, but so, in some churches, they forget that women represent half of the beauty of God, right? Man was made in, image, in God's image. Male and female, God created man. And so if a church is going to try to subjugate women and push them out, that church is missing a lot of what God wants to do in that church, right? And so what is it? Man, m males are supposed to love their wives like Christ loves the church, and does Christ subjugate us, or does he try to get the most out of us as possible? Now, if the women are in full rebellion and trying to take over the church and disrespectful and everything else, yeah, there's, that's a different story. You know, and I was trying to share with these young people, in our church, we're not freaked out about that. Because our, our, our women here are incredible. At the same time, they're very respectful. But I tell you what, the interesting thing about women is if men aren't willing to do it and they become lazy with their testosterone, women are going to fill that space and get it done. And it's this incredible nature of women, right? And so churches are out of whack and the men go, it's a woman's fault. No, it's men. Come on. You know, you're supposed to lead. And if you lead, the women will be happy and applaud your leading. But if you don't, but it's the same in the family too. Men give up. And the women will take over because... Women are incredible in that way. They just want to fill that need. Whatever, whatever the need is, they're going to fill it. You know, so there'll be mom and dad in the home if dad's shirking his responsibilities. Right? So, so the whole thing is, man, we, we look at the nature of each other, and we need to applaud each other and encourage each other and build each other up, right? You know, and, 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 and fulfill this. But we take what we are. My point is we take what we are and we surrender it to God's way. We don't try to deny that I'm a male. Even in, you know, Job's, I have determined these eyes that God gave me that show appreciation for the female form, I'm going to aim that in the right direction. Praise God, right? That's a good thing. And, and, and God's going to give Job a family back. And so he's limiting his exposure to bad things. Do we need to do that a little bit more? Some of us probably, yeah. And if you're struggling, it's okay. You know, I was, I was with someone recently, and they have a teenage boy. And about 9 o'clock, they go, okay, give me your phone. And the kid can't sleep with his phone. Why? Well, there's a lot of bad things that can happen when a boy's alone with his phone. Right? Yeah, give it up. Mom also has a little device on there that sees wherever he's been from her phone that she doesn't always have to take it. It's a good thing, right? It's much harder to recover from a fall off of a cliff than a quick stumble when you catch yourself. So guard yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Martin Luther said, it's not a sin for a bird to fly over your head. Just don't let it land and build a nest in your hair right so protect yourself verse 2 for what is the allotment of God from above 
and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high, is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? So Job's saying, I know that God will punish sinners. Does he not see my ways, verse 4, and count all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in on honest scales, that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let the harvest be rooted out. So Job is okay with just punishment and correction. He has no problem with that. He's just looking at a situation and going, something's going on here, and it's not because I'm being punished for my sin. And so he is acknowledging that God ultimately will punish sin. He's just going, this just isn't making sense. I know what my walk with God is like, and I know what my God is like. It doesn't make sense. Verse 9, if my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I've... Uh, lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. And those are just idioms for saying, if I commit adultery, or if I have adulterous thoughts in my heart, let my wife be adulterous back against me. Let me re reap what I've sown, but I, I seem to be reaping what I didn't sow. <laughs> He's saying this is unfair. Verse 11, for that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment. For that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. And so he's saying, yeah, that sexual sin is bad and, and it deserves to be challenged and cut off and dealt with. The sexual sin specifically, adultery is playing with fire. Why? Because, because it's a part of what God made for in us, right? It's not something that we can necessarily run away from because it goes wherever we go. Wherever you're at, there you are. So you need to deal with that very personally, right? And the sexual relationship when you're married is something that is supposed to unite your soul with someone else. And so when you're uniting it all these other places, specifically in adultery, you're really destroying your soul, okay? Proverbs 6, 27, dealing with this, it says, can a man take fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. So we need to be careful. Keep those dominoes from starting, right? Keep that domino effect talks about keeping your body in purity, not in passionate lust. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as the heathen do. How far is too far if you're not in a proper relationship? That place where the, the passion starts, right? Solomon wrote about the foolish young man who took his eyes to the wrong place. Proverbs 7, 6. For at the window of my house, I looked through the lattice, and I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner. And he took to the path of her house, and in the twilight of the evening, in the black and in the dark night, there was a woman who met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times, she was outside. At times, in the open square, lurking at every corner." And the end of it, a few verses down in the same chapter is, till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost him his life. In ministry, it's very interesting because there's, there's many men that fall in ministry and they lose the very thing that made them attractive in the first place. To women and normally it's that integrity or the impression of integrity that he's preaching right and so a lot of times um, in church settings a man who wouldn't necessarily be physically attractive is speaking the words of god and and he he becomes attractive to the woman who isn't getting along with her husband because he's speaking words of love and wisdom and then what happens He's flattered and he falls into the trap of adultery and he gives up the very thing that made him attractive in the first place. 
And it's done. It's, he's given up his life. Right? And why are so many willing to give up so much for so little? Why are so many willing to give up so much for so little? And that's not just adultery, but adultery is one of those things. Because you not only lose a wife of years of commitment, and deep commitment and love, but you're most likely going to lose that other person because they're willing to break up your family, and many times it happens again. Repeat offense, right? And then children lose the respect, right? So, so why are so many willing to give up so much for so little? It is a trap. And I'm very aware. Some, some people in here have gone through that, and it's been rough on your life, and it stinks, you know? But you've repented of it, and praise God, he can restore you. Absolutely loves you. Died for you. Still going to heaven. But you can look back and go, oh, man, that hurt. It's bad. It's not good. <laughs> you know, like, I understand. I gave up so much to gain so little. And Job's, you know, kind of just saying, you know, don't, don't let it go there. And I haven't let it. I've been controlled. You know, it's like that man on a diet. I'm only going to stop at the donut shop if there's a parking lot right out front. So he drives back. He, or he drives, he drives by, by the, the donuts, and lo and behold, there's a parking space right out in front on his seventh time around the block, right there. <laughs> but don't go there. You know, and I, I just, I know in my life, when I'm focused on the Lord, the temptation is much less. And when I'm busy about the business of the Lord, my temptation is much less. When I'm, being, when I'm being undisciplined and I let myself go is when the temptation is greater, right? To play mind games and things like that, right? Verse 13, if I have despised the cause of my male or female servant, when they have complained against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Did not he who made the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? <laughs> That's kind of an equality verse, right? Because even my servants, if I don't treat them well, God, you're going to judge me because they're just like me. They're human beings. They're valuable to you. Verse 16. If I have kept the poor from their desire or caused the eyes of the widow to fail or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it, but from my youth I reared him as a father and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. But if I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or any poor man without covering, if his heart has not blessed me, if he, is not warmed, if he is not, was not warm with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw I had help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let my arm be told, torn from the socket. For the destruction of God is a terror to me. And because of, of his magnificence, I cannot endure. So he says, if I have kept the poor from their desire. In verse 16. Even in Job's day, people recognized that helping the poor was a good thing. And this is what he did. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he will be blessed on the earth and you will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness and you will sustain him on his sickbed. This is written by David, but Job is one that's saying, Lord, I've taken care of the poor. Verse 24 if I have made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because of my, my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much. And Job saying, I'm not about being greedy. The love of money is not the root of any evil that I have. Money is just a tool to me is what he's saying. Verse 26, if I observe the sun when it shines or the moon moving in brightness so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an 
iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above all if I have observed the sun when it shines. And that's kind of a weird thing, but what he's saying, if, it, if I started worshiping nature, if I start worshiping the created rather than the creator himself, what is this? This is paganism. You know what Earth Day is? It's paganism. Right? It's, wor it's worshiping things that were created instead of the one that created them. And none of us can create anything greater than ourselves. So God is greater than the creation. God is greater than the creation. But when you worship the sun, the moon, and the stars, you are worshiping the created, not the creator. And they can't do anything for you. They're just created things like you are, and they're even less complex than your own body is. Right? We're the pinnacle of creation. Humankind is. Right? It says in Romans 1, 25, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't take care of what God created, right? Because Adam was told to take dominion over it, take charge of it, take care of it. I am a Christian environmentalist. But a child in the womb is more important than an eagle an eagle's egg in a nest because the child in the womb was created in God's image. But you still should take care of the eagle. <laughs> okay, just saying. This is idolatry. Verse 29, If I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me or lifted up myself when evil found him, indeed I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. If the men of my tent have not said, who is there who has not been satisfied with his meat? But no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. Job is a pretty amazing guy, isn't he? He takes care of the poor, the needy, those seeking wisdom, the rich, the poor, whoever, whatever. The sojourner, they're not going to have to sleep out in, in the storm. I give him a place to sleep every time. I mean, Job's rocking, but he's suffering greater than any of us here. He lived the way that Jesus taught. Love your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High God, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Verse 33, if I have covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the contempt for family so that I kept silent and did not go out of the door. He didn't disobey God's commandment. He didn't hide. He is open for the Lord to perceive. And I'm moving quickly here. Sorry about that. <laughs> but moving on, he hasn't been a hypocrite. He's really sought to live the Lord's principles out. He's not just a good guy. He is the best of men. He had fellowship with God. If we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we had all these three rounds of three guys just railing on him for how evil and bad he is, and he's going, uh, no, I've done things God's way, right? He has integrity. He isn't hiding his sins. Verse 35, oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me. That my prosecutor had written a book. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. If my land cries out against me and its furrows weave together, if I've eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their lives, then let thistles grow instead of wheat, and let weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. He's saying, I even take really good care of my land because I consider it as a gift from you, God. This guy's crazy good. And he's, rebut he's rebutting his friend's accusations against him. One, one final thought as we close here. And I'm sorry, we're, we're just going to close with prayer, <laughs> okay, because I, I went long. I, I underestimated how long it would take to get through these two chapters. But um, many times when we face trials, Christian, and we all have the temptation to do it, and I'm saying that I have the temptation to do it. When I'm facing a trial, 
I'm always trying to figure out why, God. Why? What am I supposed to fix right now? And we just need to know, you don't have to go digging for those things all the time. Ask yourself, Lord, is there anything? And then you can stop and just go, okay, God, I didn't, not, nothing that I know of. Unless you bring it for my attention, I'm trusting that you're just doing something. I trust it that I'm in this and you're doing something in your greater plan through this particular trial. Because, guys, so many people beat the snot out of themselves. Listen, sometimes a trial is our fault. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just not. And don't add to your trial by piling on things that aren't real or that aren't there or you start changing things. What do you do? You hold on to your relationship with Jesus. You invest in his character and his love for you and you just go, God, in the end, I know that I'm going to stand in your presence. I know ultimately you got this. I don't know what you're doing, Lord. Help me learn from it. Help others around me to grow. But whatever you're doing, God, I have to just trust in you. Some people blame everything on everybody else. That's wrong. Some people pile on themselves. That's also wrong. Because sometimes the trial that you're going through is a common trial of life or it might be a trial where God is using you to bless or challenge or show someone else what he's about. So you don't just have to go out hunting for the problems, do you? And for some of you, that's a relief because you're going, yeah, I do that. That's me, right? Because we're, we're normally of one sort or the other, <laughs> right? We're a blamer or we're a self-blamer. You know, it's either someone else's fault or and not, neither of them are right. And so Job is right in this. He's saying, God, in the end, I know that I'm going to stand before you. But right now, I don't get it. Please, please, just give me something, a breadcrumb. He does soon. It's coming. We're going to endure Job. We all ought to get t-shirts. I, I endured the teaching of Job, right? Like, <laughs> it's hard to teach. When pastors approach us, it's like, oh, no, there's a lot of chapters that are just like craziness. But I hope you've been blessed by it. But the, one of the lessons in this chapter that I see is just like, you don't have to pile on yourself. And you don't have to believe what others might be piling upon you either. God still loves you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. His blood is enough to cover or every sin that you've ever committed or ev every sin anybody's ever committed against you. He's got this. And just sometimes it's just settle down on yourself. And, 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 and get away from the self-persecution and, and, and just take the, the thing that you're just whacking yourself on the back with. And you can stop and you can just rest in the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we again just thank you for so many lessons in Job, Lord. And we just trust that uh, even as we look back, Lord, we can also look forward. Because it's a time, Lord, when things are crazy. And just for believing in you, Lord, there's, there's people that just don't like us. And may it be, Lord, that we're out to please you more than others, though. May we care about your opinion above every other opinion, Lord. May you be our strength above all, not the applause of men. May we not be flattered. May we not be moved. But may we live by your principle and the security of your love for us, for you will never leave us or forsake us. We have the hope of eternity in your promises. And Lord, you have us in your hand and nothing can take us out of that, Lord. And we are thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.